Good morning, Zdravo, Dobro dan. Uh, today uh, we have, as usual, two lectures, 7th and 8th. The 7th lecture is dedicated to Christian laws. Christian laws. So now uh, uh, we are going to make a short, no logical analysis of Christianity and Christian tradition. Uh, I would like to, to, um, to say that that is not dogmatic. We are regarding Christianity as cultural, social, uh, political, structural, philosophical phenomenon. So we don't defend or accuse Christianity, being, I presume, mostly Christian, as myself, Orthodox Christian. So we are going to treat Christianity in a correct way, but not insisting too much on our confessional preferences. So that is a kind of mm, no logical analysis. So we, are, we don't discuss the truth or heresy or what was accepted as dogmatically correct or heretic. So or everything we, we are going to speak of uh, is seen, will be regarded from the no logical point of view, which is the structural analysis. So, first of all, um, when we consider Christianity, Christian doctrine, from a logical point of view, basing on geosophy and basing on uh, three logoses, logos, we could easily, uh, from the very beginning, formulate some general principles concerning Christianity. First of all, uh, the logos of Christianity is clearly uh, Apollonian. So first of all, it is verticality. And the concept of the God, the Father, the Heavenly Father, and the Holy Trinity, and the transcendence of the Creator in front of creation, all that creates a kind of traditional Logos of Apollo that we already know. That is pure vertical organization of the metaphysical space. There is a heavenly father, father, not mother, that, have, that is in the heaven, that is in transcendence, that have, has created the world. So that is a kind of coming down from top to the down. Creation is from the eternity to the time from the heaven to the earth, from the God to the man and the other creatures. So there is purely Apollonian logic and basic dogmatical principles. All three uh, persons of Holy Trinity are considered to be male. That's very important, the masculine. The God the Father, the God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit. All three are considered as male figures, and that in the symbolical way is very important. Uh, the relation between the creature and, cre cre and creator, uh, they are hierarchical. So the uh, created thing should be submitted to creator. So that is a kind of hierarchy. And this verticality is the basic feature of Christian tradition. That is the essence of Christian tradition, that is uh, patriarchal. And it, in that affirming that, we could say that it is not the chance that this tradition uh, has developed in the, Euro in the European world, first of all. In Greece, in Rome, in Europe. And Christianity became a normative tradition for Indo-European society, not for all, but for Western part of Indo-European society, where the concept of God and its main features of Christian God, Father, was more or less cor correspondent to Zeus, to uh, Jupiter, to the male deities of pre-Christian time. So there was a kind of, in the popular consciousness, it was easy to, to replace one 
uh, Heavenly Father by other, because the figure, like uh, in German uh, language, there is a uh, word, Gestalt, Gestalt, the figure, the image, that is not the precisely person that we, that we know with its uh, qualities, but Gestalt, that kind of frame, frame of uh, Heavenly Father was the same. So that was the kind of continuity between pre-Christian tradition and Christian tradition. Continuity that was based on the structure, on the frame, on gestalt, on the typology, typology of the civilization. So that is very important and that as, as well, it is clear how we could see how Greeks, Latins, Germans, Celt, Slavs accepted one figure of Heavenly Father instead of the other. So that was a kind of transformation that didn't touch the structure of world vision of Indo-European peoples. So that is very important. There was a kind of continuity. That was uh, explained in the philosophy of some uh, first Christian apologets and saints, for example, Justin philosopher or Clement of Alexandria, that said that there was there were two branches of tradition, not only Jewish, uh, Judaic tradition before Christianity. There was as well Hellenic tradition. That was the second branch of that, and that was also sacred, but. Uh, both Judaic tradition and Hellenic tradition in Christianity were transformed and were enlightened, were transformed in something more, more correct and more true, according to Clement of Alexandria and Justin philosopher. So there was as well in the first stages of um, uh, elaboration of Christian doctrine the concept that Christianity had, has two sources, not only Judaism, but as well Hellenic, so in the European source. That was reflected above all in the Christian Platonism. A Christian Platonism started um, with, the, with the first uh, uh, was the uh, uh, apostles themselves, because uh, the fourth evangelical of John is beginning with the world, and the beginning was the Logos. Uh, and the Logos is not the world, a uh, word only, as we are translating. Nachali bolo slovo in Russian. <laughs> so, slovo it's something, it, it, a word, but the Logos is not only word. It is Logos, it is intellect, it is nous in some aspect. It's very, very, very complicated concept of Greek philosophy. And the fact that we know Evangelists only in Greek, so they may be were written in Greek and not translated from Aramaic, because the Greek was the Hellenistic koine, the language that was distributed uh, in the Mediterranean world, Oikomena, that because Christianity was born in Hellenism, in a Hellenistic context. So, uh, um, Platonism um, uh, and, uh, begins with not with um, uh, exegetic tradition, it begins with apostles, uh, apostles themselves. So, many aspects of Christian traditions from the very be beginning. Uh, was based on some Greek concept. Because in Aramaic and uh, uh, Hebrew there is no world equivalent for Logos. But that is the beginning of our teaching, Christian teaching. Um, uh, and the beginning was the Logos. Logos. And we, know, we don't know the Aramaic Semitic word used for such concept. So that was beginning in Christianity, with the beginning of Christianity, Christian theology was the Locus and Greek philosophy. That was developed later by Justin philosopher Clement of Alexandria and basically in Alexandrian school. 
with the great Origen, Ori, Ori, Ori who was Platonist, well, not Platonist, that was created the whole building of Christian theology, with the whole trinity, the transcendence of the creator, and so on. Everything was based on the Platonism, Plat Platonism, or on the teaching of Plato. Uh, they say that uh, Origen, uh, Origen so was the pupil, disciple, disciple of uh, Ammoni, Sakas, uh, Egyptian, Alexandria, maybe Greek, because Alexandria uh, was Hellenistic. It is what was, that was Egyptian in the um, traditional sense, that was Greek, Greek uh, uh, Hellenistic town, city. And there was the Ammonius Sakas, that was the um, first teacher of Neoplatonic, of the so-called Fifth Academy, <coughs> Platonic Academy, the uh, founding father of Neoplatonic tradition, and Origenes was his pupil. So that was the pure Platonic affiliation and continued. We have already spoken about the relations between Logos of Apollo and Plato's teaching. That is almost the same. Or Platonism is the best, the most the, the accomplished, the excellent, the perfect expression of Logos of Apollo. So that also the elaboration of the Christian dogmatism reflects this uh, continuity, a cultural continuity of pre-Christian tradition, and Apollonism was in the center of it. But we remark as well, and the some dogmas, uh, dogma, uh, Christian dogmas, Dionysian features. For example, there is the clear log uh, log uh, logic, the pure celestial heavenly uh, logic of Apollo in some aspect, but treating with Christology, we are dealing with Dionysian concept. Uh, Christ is the man and the God. So that is something Dionysian, something dialectical. There are two natures and one person uh, in Christ. In Holy Trinity, there is unity and trinity, so as well a kind of di dynamic, inter internal divine dynamic and, uh, and that, and the relations of the creature and the creator as well is something dialectic. It's, they are not, um, re they, the relations between them is not the, only the cause and the effects, they are intermingled. The God is present inside of creation and the incarnation of the Christ is the most important moment of the history of creation, according to Christian doctrine, and that is Dionysian element that is embedded in the Christian, uh, Christian dogmatic teaching. But what kind, as well, Dionysian, Christ dies and resurrects. He come down, comes down to the hell in order to free, liberate the ancestors. He dies and resurrects, he comes down and come up, and there is ascension um, uh, in, 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 the, in the Christian, uh, Christian uh, holidays and the saint moment. So he, um, he rises uh, from the death and he still continues, was the same in Russia, continue to, to go, go, uh, to the um, to the heaven after that after being 40 days staying 40 days with apostles so there is a pure Dionysian cycle he comes down from the heaven to the earth he came after he dies uh, he comes to the center of the hell he destroys and wins the hell uh, and after he liberates the saint souls of the ancestor and everybody go to the common general resurrection uh, with Christ in the Easter and in this ascension moment Christ returns to the heaven being the son of God and ruling in the heaven so any aspect of this of this narrative Christian narrative are purely Dionysian concerning Christ 
and purely Apollonian concerning the basic structure of the world where all these events are put in. But what kind of Dionysian logic we have? And we have already said that in Indo-European tradition, the point of Dionysus is not exactly in the center, in the center between um, uh, the Logos of Apollo and Logos of Sibylle. It is rather uh, uh, a bit higher than this dividing line, the line that uh, divides the Logos of Apollo and Logos of uh, Dionysus. It is Apollonian reading of the figure of Dionysus and in figure of Christ it is absolutely transparent, it's clear. So, all tonical, all negative aspect or um, dialectical, nocturnal aspect uh, uh, in the figure of Christ uh, are not present. So, that is purified Dionysus, that is Apollonian Dionys Dionysus. He is pure, immaculate, he has no sin, and coming to the center of the hell to win the hell and his power, he still rests God and absolutely pure. So that we are dealing with the normative two figures of classical in the European structure. So we, that is in the European religion with in the European theology with the pure victory of the patriarchy over the Logos of Sibylle. There is no sign of Logos of Sibylle uh, in this concept. And the Holy Virgin, the Mother of God, is represented as Demeter, much more uh, than a uh, purely earthly, uh, earthly figure. It is um, complete purification of the uh, female nature so she is considered to be the head of the angels, so the purity and virginity of the Holy Mother, because she uh, uh, had, uh, she did, uh, did not know the husband in the uh, normal way, and she was uh, uh, a bride of Holy Spirit, of God. So, veneration of Holy Mother is purely in the European. It is the concept of the Virgin, of the heavenly celestial, celestial Virgin, uh, and there is nothing, nothing ketonic um, in this images, image. Of. So we are dealing all the principal figures of Christianity, are Apollonian and Dionysian, in the understanding and the reading of, in Apollonian reading of Dionysus. All that. All these elements, both all of these elements, were present before the Christianity, and not in the Semitic tradition. They were the basic concept of the Hellenistic world that was based on this alliance between uh, Logos of Apollo with Logos of, of Dionysus, and peri in the periphery there were as well a, a some ketonic aspect in the Hellenism, not dominating, but they were present as the traces of the great mother uh, culture. But in Christianity there were no such, such thing. So that was the pure formula, pure version of Indo-European Logos, restored to put in its uh, brilliance, in its uh, an absolute, absolute uh, affirmation. And that is why Christianity uh, became the tradition of, of the European West. In our cultures, uh, our peoples have accepted Christianity because that, that they were Christian before the Christ. So they were prepared for this revelation. That was new. That was revelation. That was something completely different from from the past, but there was a clear structural continuity, existential horizon of Indo-European society was the same, was prepared, was ready to, to receive 
the good news. So that is very important. In our other civilization, it's almost impossible to, to, to explain what is the Christ. It is universally, but universally figured in the context of this Apollonian Logos. In the measure the Apollonian and Dionysian Logos was present in other civilizations, they could understand Christianity. But uh, it is not all, always the case, and the, we need to make a very serious work to prepare the other cultures, the other, other existential horizons to Christianity. And in Hellenistic uh, existential horizon, in, in Hellenistic space, everything was ready to receive Christianity. That is very important. So Christi Christianity is our uh, not uh, new tradition of the last uh, 2000 years. That was continuation of the old in the European tradition. So this, this structure with triads, trinity, everything were prepared. Not exactly, because in any, any reform of religion, of mythology, of tradition, of the church, there are new elements. But nevertheless, the, the essence was the same. As well, for example, the communion, the Eucharist, that was the moment when the blood of Christ, of God, becomes uh, the wine becomes the blood of God, and uh, the uh, bread becomes the body of God. That is Demeter and Dionysus, uh, prefiguration of it. So we, we could see prefiguration of Christ in the uh, Old Testament, that is completely legitimate, but as well we could see as this just Justin philosopher, Clement Alexandrine or Aragon, we could see a kind of prefiguration of Christian mysteries in Greek mysteries. Not exactly, but prefiguration. Uh, the images, anticipation, we could say, anticipation of Christianity. And uh, we have the same three functional traditions of Christianity. There are uh, priests, the patriarchs, there are kings and warriors, and there are peasants. So we have in, in the Christian society all three functions, all three in the European functions, and they lasted. This structure of society lasted in the pure form up to the beginning of the modernity. So up to the end of the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. So there is continuity as well in the social structure. There is continuity in empire. There is continuity, some continuity in the rights, in the worship practice. So, structurally, that was unity and continuity between pre-Christian in the European existential horizon and Christian existential horizon. So, uh, that is uh, uh, very important. But, at the same time, we see in the early Christianity, two centers, very contradictory centers of elaboration of Christian doctrine. There is Alexandrian school and there is Antiochian school. The, normally, uh, they say <coughs> that uh, everybody agrees about the quality, philosophical and metaphysical quality of Alexandrian school founded by St. Apostle Marcus and developed by um, Clement of Alexandria, by Oregon. And tradition of the Oregonism came after to Cappadocians, to St. Basil the Great, uh, St. Uh, Gregory and, and the other. And that was uh, the dogmatic accepted in the first three uh, ecumenical councils. So that was the kind of victory of Alexandrian school. And uh, the basis of the axis, conceptual axis of it, was Platonism, Neoplatonism, in different form. The highest point of Christian Neoplatonism is Dionysus of Areopagit, uh, Dionysius Areopagit, uh, Areopagitus, in his work, works. 
that is pure Platonic, Christian Platonicism, the creation of the nine orders of uh, uh, supernatural na uh, angels, the um, uh, powers, uh, and all that was uh, all the mysteries uh, of Christian mysteries were explained in um, this um, Platonic. Platonic uh, symbolism. So there is clear Alexandrian tradition, and that is one part of Christian teaching. There is Antiochian school that gave many heresiarchs as uh, Arius, Nestorius, and the other. Uh, that was opposed uh, to Alexandrian school. And they say that that was a kind of Semitic spirit uh, orientated against Greek or in the European spirit. So, if uh, Alexandrian tradition was based on the symbolical, allegorical uh, reading of well, the Old Testament, New Testament, and giving to, and that is normal for Platonicism. Uh, the Plato's teaching regards everything that exists as a symbol of the ideas. So everything should be read as symbolical text. So every, every, everything, every event, every figure, every person should be regarded as an icon, as an image of the paradigm. So that, hence, the symbolical, allegorical reading of Alexandrian school of any any sacred text. That is completely normal. And they say that in the case of Antiochian school, that was different approach, literal. And they say that is Semitic, because it was not so much Greek with Platonism, Platonism but that was historic. So that was the history that was, that, that is called sometimes Judeo-Christian reading of uh, Christianity, and we could say that Alexandrian school is um, uh, in the European reading of or Greek, uh, Hellenistic reading of uh, Christianity. I uh, thought the same before I have started to, to study that more closely, closer, this, this aspect. Because Antiochian school was situated in Syria, Antiochia, uh, that was considered where the main Semitic population, it was considered to be Semitic. But starting to, to, to study Antiochian school and his, uh, his the, and the, and the phenomenon of Judeo-Christianity that was opposed to Alexandrian school, and after, after um, writing the book on Semitic laws, I have one volume of Noma here dedicated to Semitic uh, laws, the laws of, of Semites. I have discovered that that is not so. So Semitic laws is quite different. It is based on uh, uh, on uh, kind of Titanism uh, of Baal in the pre-Judaic tradition, uh, there was a very patriarchal version of the Eastern Semitic tradition of Akkadian and Assyrian in the Babylonia that it was similar to a Hittite tradition or later to Iranian tradition. And there was Judaic tradition that was in some way anti-Semitic because the Judaic Logos by the Judaism, traditional Judaism, was against all the people living in the Kana, mostly Semites, uh, with the cult of Baal. Baal that was titanic deity that demanded bloody sacrifices of, of the, chi of the chi uh, children. And Judaism was opposed to it, absolutely opposed, but no aff affirming mm, something special. That was a kind of counter identities so uh, the the most anti-semitic tradition historically was Ju Ju uh, jewish tradition because that was opposed to any semitic 
cultural horizon of Canaan that was anti-Canaan in any senses. So the Jews blamed all people living around them because they were supporters of Baal's cult. And they opposed to them in the early stage of Jewish tradition something very special. Uh, so we could call that old God because the Baal was considered by the most Semitic people as new God, a, ki a kind of the lesser God that didn't receive the heritage and has um, started to revolt against the old God. So the mostly uh, Semitic traditions, uh, Western Semitic tradition, were uh, on the side of the new God, Baal, with some Titanic Dionysian features, by that was the black double of Dionysus. We have spoken about that. And the Je Je Jewish tradition was against this new God, against Val, in favor of Al God, old God, that was dethroned by, uh, by Val. But that, that had, had nothing to do with Christianity, not so Val nor old God. So Christianity was completely different. And in Antiochian school, I have found not this inter-Semitic drama of Western Semites, Syrian, Aramean, not, not uh, Jewish, and Jewish uh, tradition, but something completely different. I have discovered their Iranism in pure form. That was Iranistic tradition. And if we consider the late Judaism, the Judaism <coughs> after Babylonian captivity, we could easily identify in that uh, the, the second temple Judaism, so-called second temple Judaism, Iranian uh, topics. That was a kind of original Judaic tradition transformed in the Zoroastrian Iranian context. Hence the concept of Messiah that was, was absent in the early Judaism, the history, the salvation, the resurrection, all that appears during Babylonian captivity in the late stage and, and the second temple Judaism. So the late Judaism was Iranized form of Judaism and, and not so Semitic in Jewish, originally Jewish or not Jewish, other Semitic people sense. But that is very important. And Antiochian tra tradition was much more dualistic and uh, Ira uh, 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 Iranistic as well. Not Iranian, but Iranistic, because um, uh, Semitic people, the, uh, after the Achaemenid Empire, they lived, including in the Hellenistic time, they were living under great influence of Iranian logos. And this dualism, in many cases uh, later, uh, and uh, all kinds <coughs> of messianic tendencies, very similar to Christianism, but they all this messianism that was the logical result of the concept of the war of light, and uh, the appearance of the, uh, at the end of the time, the figure of the last king and the savior. All that is, in our eyes, completely Christian, but, or in the late Judai, Jewish in the late Judaism, but in Iranian tradition, only in Iranian tradition, all that obtains the real metaphysical structural meaning, because that was uh, all Iranian metaphysics explain why so, because the history, because of the uh, war between the light and darkness. So Antiochian tradition was Iranistic school, and we have in Christianity a kind of quarrel between the uh, Greek Advaita, non-dualistic Platonism, in case of Alexandrian school, that we could call mostly Greek and Plata, Platonic, and we have Iranistic, dualist, historic version of it. Not so much 
symbolic but historic in the sense of messianism. But messianism is not Jewish. Messianism is Iranian, metaphysical Iranian. So we have a kind of discussion or debates on the new stage between two logoses, both of them in the European, both of them um, vertical, both of them patriarchal, but there with different edition, we could say, different, different editions. So that was uh, the dialogue between, not between Judaism and Hellenism, that was dialogue between Hellenism uh, with um, uh, Greek domination and Iranism with Iranian domination. All that was also the part of Christianity. And in Christianity, in Christian doctrine, we have two poles. We could be more Platonic or more Iranistic, Messianic. And Judeo-Christianity, it is not Jewish spirit, it is Iranian spirit. Judeo-Christianity is Iranistic version of reading of Christianity. So we have, and that def defines all history of Christian uh, dogmatic, uh, dogmatic councils. First seven councils, three first councils were, were, were victory of Alexandrian school over Antiochian school, over Arius and the first council, over Nestorius after that, and defeat of the Antiochian tradition that was much more inclined toward dualistic version. That is why Christus wasn't considered as God. He was considered a saint, as prophet, as the last uh, savior, but not God. Because there was a kind of difference, a position between um, um, the material world and spiritual world. So, uh, and uh, uh, there is dualism and Nestorianism, Arianism developed in Antiochian Iranistic uh, school and uh, monism, spiritual monism developed in the Alexandrian school. Both of them had heretic version that were outside the Christian dogmatic orthodoxy in uh, an Antiochian school gave Arius and Nestorius and they were considered to be heresies. And as well, the radicality of Alexandrian Platonism gave the other extremity, uh, monophysite heresy, represented by the disciples of um, Cyril of Alexandria, of Tichy and the other, Tichius, Eutychius and the other. So that was a kind of uh, monotheism, uh, monophysite, monophysite heresy that was purely uh, excessive Platonism, uh, uh, Greek version, and excessive Iranian <coughs> and Nestorian version. So uh, th they were extremities, heretic extremity of the legitimate orthodox point of view, because the other part of Alexandrian school with Cappadocians, with Basil the Great, and uh, Saint Gregory of uh, 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 and uh, the other Cappadocian teacher, as well the other part of uh, Antiochian school, because uh, Saint John Chrysostom, Zlatavus, was representative of Antiochian school, but was considered to be absolutely orthodox. So there were heretic version versions, and there were completely orthodox version of both of them. And when they say that uh, uh, during Justinian the Platonicism and Origenism were blamed, that is the fact, and considered to be heresy, it concerns only radical part of this Platonicism, not, for example, not the teaching of the Saint Basil the Great, that were the direct continuator, or, or that didn't concern Dionysus of Areopagite, that was uh, Areopagite, that he was accepted as uh, authority, as orthodox authority. So, it, oh, for example, uh, excommunication of Nestorius didn't affect uh, John Chrysostom. So, John Chrysostom is considered the most orthodox figure in 
Orthodox, uh, uh, Orthodox Church, but he was representative of this historical, not symbolical, historical Iranian, I would say, Iranistic uh, version of um, Christian uh, doctrine. So, fir first three councils were, uh, were victory of the Alexandrian school, and second three, a kind of revenge of the Antiochian. After uh, the end of pure Antiochian school. Antiochian school was destroyed and defeated, but the tendency to, to moderate this Alexandrine um, uh, Neoplatonic version um, still existed. And the next three, uh, um, fourth, fifth and uh, sixth uh, uh, ecumenical councils were a kind of uh, uh, victory over the Antiochian spirit, not the school, but spirit, because that was moderation of the pretensions of more most radical representative of Alexandrian school. So that was a kind of balance, and that was a kind of uh, finally that was the victory of the Hellenism, but this time Christian Hellenism, where the uh, two forms of Iranian and Hellenistic, um, historic and non-dualist, symbolic, all that was united in the context of the, of the first, uh, uh, on the dogmatic, Christian dogmatic, Orthodox dogmatic, and the seventh, seventh uh, ecumenical council, council uh, was dedicated to the was not so important concerning metaphysics that was about uh, iconoclasm. So uh, that, was, that had as well relations to this, uh, but not so directly. So we have in Christianity, what is important, we have continuation of the Mediterranean Hellenistic uh, existential horizon with two poles, with uh, Iranistic and Greek poles, uh, and that was a kind of new form, or new ideology of the tradition in the European horizon. There we could, uh, um, uh, as well, uh, we could say that uh, there was difference uh, regarding the woman. Uh, in the Christianity. And we see uh, two approaches as well very proper to in the European society. On one side there is a kind of anelegenia that I'm calling. So there is a recognition of the full dignity of woman and a kind of equality, spiritual equality between men and women in Christ. There is the, the saying called the St. Paul that there is no man, no woman, but only Christ. So that is a recognition of the dignity of the uh, soul of woman that is equal to the soul of man. So that is the kind of this partnership, the friendship, traditional Turanian, as we have said uh, yesterday, Turanian um, friendship between uh, the warrior of women female warrior, a male warrior, uh, and the defense of, of, of the identity that was the female warriors the, uh, the, uh, and male warriors uh, as the warriors of Christ. So that is equality, spiritual equality of the souls. At the same time, there was the second relations between man and woman that was a reflection of this uh, coming of the nomadic in the uh, European over matriarchal society, where there was a kind of submission of the woman to the man. That is reflected in the other saying of St. Paul, when, for example, woman cannot teach in church, woman should uh, be submitted to the husband and the other. That is hierarchy in equality. Both version of gender archetypes traditionally for in the European society in, in its historic relations with the uh, matriarchal society. There is a kind of hierarchical submission and on the other level a kind of friendship 
and equality in spiritual dignity. So that is a, a kind of best solution or, or, or more organic and natural solution for the concrete historical society we are dealing with, not with the abstracts. So in our our tradition and how our, these horizons, how these spiritual and cultural spaces and civilizations were pre created during their historical and existential development, that was the best solution that satisfied both demands of equality and hierarchy in very concrete way. So that was reflected in the Christian tradition. That was not casual. That, that was something very, very, um, um, as uh, Platonism was a reflection or expression of this uh, logos of Apollo, Christian tradition was excellent and perfect reflection of this Apollonian Dionysian style of civilization. That is the reason why we are Christians. So we have, uh, we were not obliged to be Christians. We have accepted that as something that we knew before. That was the kind of remembrance of our identity. So that is our, our identity of Christian uh, tradition that was recognized by the people of the Mediterranean Hellenistic context because that was continuation of the same relations in the best way, I would say. At the same time, we see continuity in empire, because Christianity was accepted as religion and ideology of empire with Constantine the Great, and um, the, precisely the concept of... Um, there was developed very important concept that is this time Iranian by its origin. The concept of katechon. Katechon, that is the Greek name for that uh, who supports. Katechon, that is uh, participle of uh, uh, Greek word kata echein. Kata, it is under, echein, it to have. Uh, that, that is uh, uh, in uh, Russia, uh, in Russian language, udzierzyłoshi, dzierżajaj in uh, Slavonic, Church Slavonic, dzierżajaj. Uh, that uh, who keeps, who supports. And uh, this figure appears in the second uh, uh, Peter, epistle, uh, the letter of the St. Paul to the uh, Thessalonians, where there is concrete, concrete phrase, the son of the perdition, the son of uh, the Antichrist, will not come till the supporter, Katecho, uh, that um, who supports, who keeps, will be taken from the ambience. That was enigmatic phrase. So. There is that some figure that resists the coming of Antichrist. And because there is historical vision of Christianity, messianic vision of Christianity, and that reflects not Platonic version of the, of, of the, of the eternity of the world, but dialectic of history that is Iranic. So there appear some figure that fight against Antichrist. And that figure is key figure in the Iranian historical sequence, Iranian laws, that is represented by sacred emperor in Iranian tradition. So in Iran there is Iranian kingdom and the sacred king of this kingdom is that who fights uh, the, the forces of uh, the darkness and don't, doesn't let them to invade uh, the, the world. So that is purely Iranian figure. That didn't exist in the Greek concept. In the Greek uh, idea there was not such figure. But in Roman 
uh, ideology. In the Roman Empire, that was that appears something like that, not so clearly defined, under influence of Iranian, because Iranism was the part of the Hellenism, and Hellenism was the main culture of Roman Empire. That was a lot Latin Empire. That was Roman Empire that was based on the Hellenistic culture. We have spoken about that. And what is important that this figure uh, evoked, mentioned, and the Saint Paul, and the second letter to uh, Thessalonians, was identified clearly by Saint John Chrysostom as well, very important because he was representative of Iranistic branch of Christian theology or, or the school of Antiochian, Antiochian school. But it's clear that before him as well was identified as the figure of Roman Emperor. So Catechon that was Roman Emperor, the king of the, of the empire. And there was theology of empire uh, uh, linked to the eschatology, the end of time, the resurrection, the final apostasy, all the cyclic historic vision of Christian church was based on this figure. And above all in Byzance, but not only. In Byzance that was dogmatic, that was ideology of Byzance. Uh, in Byzantine uh, existential space, in Byzantine culture, the Katechan was emperor, but Christian emperor. He was considered to be a kind of exterior bishop, exterior bishop of the church. So he was the key figure of the sacred king that fights against the coming of Antichrist. And he was with patriarch. Uh, they were a kind, they made a kind of symphony. The term is from Christian Orthodox tradition, symphony of the powers. Symphony of the powers was based on the alliance between patriarch, the representative of the spiritual authority, and emperor, not normal king, nor knyaz, nor prince. Emperor was not only secular ruler. Emperor was sacred figure of Katechon. So he was linked to the cycle, the historical cycle, where there is empire with emperor as the head. There is no antichrist. We are living in the Christ's world. We are living, so empire obtains with emperor new dimension. It's not only political organization, it is the sacred organization that is Christian, Apollonian, Dionysian at the same time, Apoll Apollonia Dioni Dionysian version of organization of political reality as cosmic reality. Because the Antichrist, the son of perdition, as in the Saint Paul, is not only historical person, it is manifestation of the darkness. It is manifestation of the cosmic, political, historical, metaphysical form. And the dualism is not Christ against Antichrist. It is completely artificial. There was not the case. Christ was, is God and was considered a God. He could not be put on the same level as Antichrist. But Imper was the figure that was symmetric to Antichrist. Christian Imperator. Imperor. And he was put in the connections because he was the obstacle. He was the resistance. And he was a symbolic figure that united Christian world and gave to it its vertical axis. So that was uh, the, the, the very important uh, figure as well, continuing the same pre-Christian tradition. But in Christian situation, empire, church, theology, patriarchy, dogmatic tradition, orthodoxy, all that formed the Christian 
orthodox ideology that is very important as a new form of all elements uh, that pre-existed, that existed before Christianity. That is very important. That was, but the form, if we put together all these elements of verticality, of the Dionysian uh, nature of Christ, of historical messianism, of Iranism, and uh, the figure of the sacred empire, all that, we have a teaching, a full teaching that reflects not new teaching of Christianity, but reflects, I would say, eternal, or so-called eternal, moment of no machia of Indo-European society. So that was the, uh, at this time, there was the, uh, the figure of the Saturn that was, that represented ketonic forces or the uh, uh, Babylonian whore, that the, uh, the, the red, uh, red Babylonian woman, Babel, was, it is the great mother in that, uh, in that context. And the, that, that is the figure of the Sibylle, Babylonian, that was a kind of uh, close to Anatoly. So that symbolically, that we, we, we had all these logos in Christian, in Christian context. There is the um, Scarlet Woman, by the Great Babel, the Babylonian whore, that uh, was a uh, kind of figure of the Logos of Sibylle. There is a Saturn or Antichrist as representation of Saturn as Titan. Uh, and in some um, Christian texts, uh, they, they, uh, both terms were used, Titan or Saturn, they, they considered to be very close. So that is a kind of uh, the serpent, the dragon, dragon that is consort of the great mother, traditional. So they they try to overthrow Christian empire that is under uh, under power of uh, spiritual figure of the patriarch or bishop and sacred king emperor. So that is completely, and that was reorganization of the Indo-European existential space in Christian time. So we have new ideology, Christian ideology, new religion, Christian religion, and we have very old tradition that was reflected in that. So Christianity was based on the victory of the Saturn. The Saturn was chained for time being uh, and put under the control of the empire. And the figure of Tsardom, uh, kingdom, the figure of Tsar and, ki and sacred king, was a kind of the, uh, of the seal, of, of, of the sigil, uh, pechat, uh, seal, over this victory of the uh, Christian church <coughs> over Satan, and civilian world. So that was the, the, the situation was sealed with the king. So king was sealed. If we put together the seal, everything, uh, everything is destroyed. And there is a kind of explosion because this Christian kingdom and Christian civilization, Christian society was based, was constructed not on, on nothing. That was constructed on the shoulder of the Saturn, or the shoulder of the uh, ketonic power, controlled and domesticated and submitted by the Logos of Apollo, but always, always chained in the hell, but always alive. And when uh, the king and the emperor will be too weak, as well the, the topic, the subject of classical Iranian tale, he will become too weak and he could not resist the appearance of the Antichrist. Antichrist will appear and the Saturn will liberate from that liber liberalism, liberate itself from the hell in order to come to this human society. And that was explosion of the underground, or a kind of return of Sibylle, 
with dragon as a scarlet woman as Babylonian whore with the serpent that should destroy the kingdom destroy the church and create completely new new civilization that belong to other level of the uh, to other existential level so that all was the, and is normal world vision of christian uh, christian orthodoxy it was preserved much more in the eastern church in byzantine tradition in orthodoxy it is still still the norm so if we come to the mount athos and if we speak with the monks for the men it's possible for uh, come to mount athos for women not uh, but if we come there come there we could find exactly the people with the same consciousness they will repeat exactly what i have said today and there that is normative normative world vision of orthodoxy so the 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 meaning of the catechon the meaning of the sacred uh, roman empire the uh, the concept of the uh, um, of, of uh, church and god and dignity of man a fight against uh, the evil against the satan against diamonds and uh, what uh, normally uh, the monks of Mount others do there? They fight. They are fighting against the demons. Day and night. They, 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 they are in fight. And that's concrete. And if we are reading Paisius or, or from Athos, Mount Athos, we see that the fight obtained a well physical physical dimension it is not only metaphor it is the physical the physical fight struggle against the the powers of, of darkness so it still continue in mount Athos. it still continue in politics we will see it later but what is important that we we have a complete world vision with absolute with all um, all aspect of normative normative laws and relations between uh, man and nature political laws social laws based on christian teaching so christian teaching is not only church it's not only cult and worship it is world vision so it includes political normative ideas it includes a kind of monarchism, inner, embedded. You could not be in normally democrat and being Christian. So you should be in some way, in some way, uh, um, in, in, in that context, uh, you should recognize the validity of teaching all the katechon. It is not a preference or political opinion that you could form basing on your own position. It is orthodox point of view and that is obligatory in some way. So that, that is in the European root of, of uh, Christianity. As well, we have some norms, we have some um, social relations, gender relations, family relations and the other parts that are normative and Christian and that reflects this, uh, they reflect uh, this uh, complete world vision so Christianity is much more than cult worship and church that is we could say ideology or in the European uh, world vision in new and actual form that is that lasts still up to today when we have Christian church with normal traditional priests and um, parish and normal men, we have the same today. Today, in Russia, in Mount Athos, in Serbia, in Bulgaria, in Macedonia, in Romania, and uh, in Ukraine. So, uh, in Greece, 
where there is traditional orthodoxy, we have the same vision. The vision, so culture, civilization. That was as well the case for Latin church, with, uh, but with much more accent on the power of spiritual authority over emperor. And, but that was after the, um, Charles the Great, as well, in our eyes, usurpation of the identity or the status of the emperor, of the sacred emperor by Charles the Great. But, and that was the split in Catholic tradition between emperor and pope of Rome. But the domination the uh, 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 do dominating tendency in Catholicism was much more a position between two kingdoms formulated in St. Augustine, who was money king. Uh, the idea that uh, the uh, uh, Pope of the Rome is representing of the spiritual vertical as well, but once more in the European, everything in the European Verticality was represented by Rome, and uh, the kings were not sacred. That idea that the Roman sacred pope should rule over purely secular kings. But with the institution usurped in our eyes uh, by Charles the Great, that was as well uh, in the figure of emperor. And that was reflected in the Ghibellinian tradition, the fight against the Guelphs, against the Ghibellins uh, in um, uh, Western uh, history. So there was as well a, a kind of catechon for them. And this catechonian Western, Western Christian tradition lasted up to the Habsburg, up to the uh, Aust uh, Austrian Empire. So the uh, Habsburgian emperors were, were considered to a continuator of this function, of the Catechonian function. So Austrian Empire in the Catholic version. We didn't recognize the status of Ka uh, Charles the Great. And that was, we had at the time uh, uh, by Byzance uh, Imperatrice Irena, and that was the uh, anti-feminist move of the Catholic. They consider that the woman cannot rule a uh, sacred empire, and that's why they have uh, appropriated the title of the emperor. Uh, in the case of uh, Charles, uh, Charles the Great, uh, but uh, Charlemagne, Charlemagne. But at the same time, we don't speak about who was right. We are speaking how structurally that worked, how how that functioned. And that concept of this sacred emperor was uh, certified from the beginning of the ni uh, um, ninth uh, uh, century uh, in the emperor tradition of the uh, kings of Frank, and after that to Habsburg and Austrian Empire was the last last moment of this uh, Western. Catechonian tradition. Uh, but uh, that was the kind of emperor line. It was not so much accepted by popes of, of the Rome, but what is interesting, that was nevertheless recognized by Catholic and by Guelphs also, with not such um, interpretation as in the case of Ghibellins, but as well. So Guelphs, the partisans of the absolute power of the Pope of the Rome over secular kings of the Western Europe as well in this tradition, in the Guelphian tradition, uh, the status of catechon was recognized by emperor. Not so clear, but recognized as well. So that was interesting that they were as well, that the Western Church recognized that. Uh, so uh, we had to, to version of Christian civilization, Eastern, that is more, uh, more, it's closer to original version, to all the proportions where they concert up to the now. That was the kind of 
interrupted, uninterrupted tradition of this uh, in the European heritage coming to Christian form, Hellenism, as I have explained, and fixed in the form of uh, seven ecumenical council, councils. And there was much more, I would say, contradictory Western Christian tradition, but in the same limits. And Catholicism have conserved that almost up to the Second Vatican Council. But after that began the kind of collapse, collapse of, of, of Western Christianity. But nevertheless, that was a kind of uh, tradition, uh, continuation of tradition. So uh, Catholicism and Austrian Empire were two, two, two forces of this Christian conservatism, of, the, of this mi Middle Ages tradition of the Western Europe. The, the, the cults came with Protestantism, and Protestantism was the third form that concerned only Western Christianity. So we should, in order to, to, to think about Protestantism uh, of this form, third, third branch of, of Christianism, we need to put ourselves not in the context uh, um, Orthodox against Catholic, but Catholic against something else. So Orthodox are out of, of the picture. So they, 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 they didn't participate in nothing in that, in that conflict. And interesting that at the origins of the Protestantism, we, we could find very, very correct ideas. First of all, the idea that the uh, Roman Church is corrupted, totally corrupted, and has usurped relations between the man and Christ. Uh, that was reflected in the concept of what is the church in Catholicism. Because for Catholics, the church is the community of the priests. And what are the other Christians? They are semi, quasi, almost Christians. So they, they were a kind of kind of outside circle around the church, not inside the church. That is very, very important. For us, it's strange because dogmatic, orthodox understanding of what is church, it is community of all baptized people. So not only priests, but as well any Christians. So church is the community all the baptized Christians, not all the priests and non priests. And Catholic tradition was quite different. So there was a kind of hierarchy, but in spiritual sense. So the hierarchy that interrupted direct relations between men, the ordinary Christian, with God, that should pass through priests, through Pope of Rome. That was the kind of intermediary obstacle. Maybe that was necessary, maybe not. We don't speak about good or bad. We, we, we try to uh, understand or describe it structurally, structurally. But nevertheless, there was a kind of interruption between the relations of man and God. And the early Christians, uh, early Protestants, early Protestants, and above all the German mystics, as Master Eckhart, Heinrich, Heinrich von Suso, uh, and uh, 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 at lesser scale, Albertus Magnus, uh, but uh, rain mystics, uh, they affirm that there is, there should be, inner relation between the um, heart of the man with the Christ. It shouldn't pass through uh, exterior relations. For us, there is no problem. Because in Orthodox tradition, we recognize both. We recognize completely authority of the Church and completely these direct relations because we have the other concept of the Church. So for us, the problem could not exist because we could not understand that. In our situation, there is no split. There is both. We have both ways, inner and outer. But for Western <coughs> Christian tradition, there was a problem. And first, uh, Protestants, pre-Protestant um, mystics, they say, good, let us 
accept outer exterior form, but let us proceed in the inner way. And they were platonic because they 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 they, they say that we we, we 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 have the direct relations with God, and God could speak inside of us, and and that is our inner dimension. So they were really Christian in our today they were more closer to orthodox in some way but they were uh, for example um, um, in the uh, master Eckhart that, that there was uh, but there was excesses uh, as well of platonism about for example uh, master Eckhart said that there is something beyond the trinity the unity beyond the trinity that is not too much orthodox, but nevertheless the main idea was so. And this uh, radical subject concept, the, the concept of the of, of the inner self that is living in the heart, and the inner Christ as they called it, that was at the origin of the Protestantism. In Wycliffe, in Husits, uh, in Gusit uh, Czechs, and uh, German mystics, mystics, mystics so that was legitimate up to some moment. But when they tried to oppose this teaching with Luther and Calvin uh, to uh, Catholic tradition, they have lost tradition in itself. They have lost uh, uh, icons, uh, the monks, uh, monasteries, uh, and church as such. So trying to to. To, to clear the direct access from man to, to God, they destroy the, the sacredness. And they put what we could call radical subject. So inner self that is living inside of our soul, they replace that with normal individuality, with profane individual, individuality. So that was a kind of religious individualism instead of this mystical dimension because when they uh, protestantism began to 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 expand itself it appealed to the masses it could not be could not have this special uh, inner experience and that was full perversion that was destruction of christianity because uh, from the legitimate starting point of the early Protestantism, or maybe pre-Protestant mysticism of, of Wycliffe or uh, European uh, Platonicist, uh, that was a kind of destruction of the traditional Catholic society. And uh, that was titanic. So the idea, because there is kind of inner self that is divine, uh, but if we affirm not this utmost radi radical interiority where in the center of our heart Christ lives, if we put this, the same the instance, if we shift to the exterior aspect, instead of the real subject, radical subject, we are receiving positive subject, so something kind, not... Um, not the third man in the mystical language of the um, of the Taurer, Jürgen Taurer. He has said there, is, there are three men in one us. There is the uh, the man a beast that is exterior. There is a man rational that is so, uh, second man, and there is hidden mysterious secret man inside of us that is radical subject, and he has. Uh, relations with God. It is mystery man, third man, inside of us, inside of inside, not only inside of body, but inside of, of the soul, the, the, the mysterious point that is hidden in our mind. And this third man and uh, second man, the rational man, the soul of man, they are not the same. They are in a position. And the first mystics, they defended this third man, hidden man, the secret man, mystery man, and normal Protestantism made shift from third man to the second man, and they affirmed the dignity of something that is 
that, that shouldn't have su such dignity because there, there is no possible direct relation with this, uh, between second man, rational man, positive subject, and God. It, is, it should be always uh, to have some intermediary. Direct relation is impossible. And the pretension to have such relation is titanic, purely titanic. So that was transformation of, of, of the logos in that. Uh, in the early Protestantism, that was a kind of legitimate claim to have uh, relations between third man, hidden man inside of us and God. And uh, in that normal uh, profane Protestantism was completely completely different approach. And that was the, the fatal and that was destruction of traditional society. That was because of this titanism appearing in Luther, uh, Lutheran uh, teaching, but above all in Calvinist. Calvinism is much worse than uh, Lutheranism. Calvinism is radical, radical absence of, uh, of any sacredness and world, that is glorification of the uh, second man as, the, uh, uh, as the, um, the only one. So that is profanism, that is destruction of uh, uh, sacredness, and that was the premise for creation of modern post-Christian civilization. So Protestantism was the break in the great wall of Christian civilization, and that was, that was destruction of Western Christian tradition. So, uh, and in order to, to, to prepare the next lecture, prepare us for the next lecture, about neological analysis of modernity, we could um, finish this uh, lecture that uh, now we could make, uh, anticipating the next lecture, make a very, very short um, analysis of what is de-Christianization of modern society. That it was destruction of Logos of Apollo and Logos of Dionysus. That was destruction of Indo-European heritage. That was not only exchange or replacement of one religion, Christian religion, by secular version. That was catastrophe that is much deeper than only, only the fall of Christianity. That was the fall of Logos. That was ours before Christianity. That was destruction of all form of verticality and that was the real coming of Antichrist, liberation of the Satan from the chain of the hell and eruption, intervention, invasion of titanic power in existential horizon of European culture. So now we could evaluate the weight, what was done with Protestantism with the Christianization. So that is new moment of Noomachia, because Noomachia had the same moment, the victory of the Logos of Apollo with Logos of Dionysus against the Logos of Sibylle. That was the beginning of our civilization. That was the first chart. That was the, the, the first basic event that, that was a kind, of, kind of rave. We lived during thousands of years, basic in this, on this moment of Naumachia, having contradictory uh, existential horizons inside of our society, but domination was precisely that. That was the we we lived in the victory of light over darkness, and that didn't begin with Christianity. That continued with Christianity. So we we, we are so uh, we, we were happy during many thousands of years, being the the sons of the light, to live in the kingdom of light, with all the problems, with all the dramatic aspects of this, of this, of the Dionysian aspect of this, uh, dying and uh, resurrecting and 
um, being destroyed and uh, winning uh, a new our Nomachian Nomachia, our battles. And uh, with, um, uh, with decrystallization came something absolutely radical from no logical and geosophical point of view. So we, we, will, we are going to see what in the next lecture, now the break.